13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 13. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. And I'd like to start by sharing a little story. So uh, a couple of weeks ago at our Grace Group, um, Christine Felmingham shared a a funny story about one of her sons. She's given me permission to share it. Um, One one of her sons, they they came home one day, and uh, there was a a few grocery bags at the door, and the the door was unlocked, but but no one was home. A bit weird. Uh, So I wondered if something maybe had happened, so they... They popped next door, there's a, a lovely Christian family next door as well, just to see if maybe they knew what, you know, where they were or if anything had happened, but um, no one home there as well, so uh, no answers, not quite sure what's going on. And So he just, he just called a, a couple of people that he knew, um, called a guy from the church that he knew, didn't answer their phone. The non-Christians did answer their phones, though. <laughs> I think you see where this is going. So... <laughs> Later, when, uh, when Colin and Christine got home, Christine goes into the living room and sees her son, and without hesitation, the first words out of his mouth, oh, thank goodness, I thought you were raptured. <laughs> it's a funny story in hindsight. I enjoyed it, but just think for a moment, what a, what a scary moment for that, it must have been for that kid. Um, now, as Andrew addressed last week, uh, the believers at uh, Thessalonica they kind of had a similar thing. They kind of thought that they'd, they'd missed out too. I'll just read the first two verses again for you. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. See, they, they thought the day of the Lord had already come and that they'd missed out on being gathered to him. Imagine the fear that this would bring or the, the questions it would raise. What, what must they have been thinking? Right? Have, we, have we just misunderstood this whole day of the Lord thing or is it actually, worst case scenario, are we not even saved like we thought we were? Well, Paul's purpose in, in writing what we find in chapter 2 is to address both of those thoughts, which we'll talk more about soon, but but the big picture purpose of of chapter 2, both last week and this week, is is really Paul saying to the Thessalonians, you can be confident that the Lord has definitely saved you. And that kind of means, spoiler alert, that's kind of the main point of the sermon too, but um, because of this, I do need to just make a, a quick distinction about who Paul is writing to, who this message is for. See, Paul, Paul writes this message to a group of people whom he knows, as far as man can know, are definitely saved. How does he know this? Well, uh, Luke 6 reminds us, uh, a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit, and a, a bad tree doesn't bear good fruit, fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. In other words, if you are in Christ, there will be evidence of this. Paul has been able to see the evidence of God's salvation in the Thessalonians. There are a number of passages that describe his confidence. I've just chosen one, and it's from chapter 1, uh, verse 3. We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, since your faith is flourishing and the love each one of you has for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your perseverance and faith in in all the persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. It is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you will be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you also 
are suffering. So even just within those few verses, um, the, there's a number of the fruits of the Spirit that get a mention, but uh, notably, though, in, in verse 5, the fact that they persevered through persec- persecutions and afflictions is clear evidence that you'll be counted worthy of God's kingdom. So, so Paul's letter, which is, which is written to, to bolster and encourage confidence in their salvation, is specifically written to a people who already demonstrate clear evidence of their salvation. If there's a person that we know, for example, living in unrepentant sin, and they say, oh, I, just, I don't know if I'm saved, we don't go and assure that person, oh, no, no, you're definitely saved, it's okay. We go quite the opposite, right? No, I agree, you, you need to repent. Maybe more lovingly than that. But you know what I'm saying. Okay, so I'm just saying this early because I, I don't want there to be any confusion. If you've not repented of your sins uh, and don't trust in Jesus as your Savior, if you don't bow your knee before Jesus as your Lord, you are not saved. But, but please, talk. Uh, you've already had the uh, invitation from Andrew this evening. Talk to someone here tonight if that's you. Right? If you don't know the, the, the wonderful and incredible love of Jesus, we, we want to tell you. Okay? And you'll get a lot of it in tonight's message, but definitely not everything. Something that you can definitely take away from this sermon, though, if, if this is you, is that if you, if you do come to God, if you come to Him and He does save you, which He will if you come to Him, you can be 100% definitely confident in that salvation. It is, not, it is not something that anyone can ever take away from you. So, with that distinction about who this message is for, let's keep going and, and look into what Paul's written. Now, he writes to the Thessalonians, as we said, to, to address and alleviate the fears that maybe they're not saved. Okay? And his response is, his counsel is twofold. The first part of his counsel provides kind of context-specific instruction and information. So Andrew took us through that last week, and it's, it's where Paul provides this, this context-specific information that corrects their understanding of the issue at hand. See, see, a lack of security in your salvation, it, it stems from somewhere. There's, there's a reason, an underlying cause, and that needs to be addressed. So for the Thessalonians, he teaches them correctly about the day of the Lord um, and how they can be sure that it hasn't happened yet. Now, this reason is pretty unlikely to happen now, nowadays, but it did happen to Christine's son. Um, but we might see reasons such as maybe someone's fallen back into a mindset uh, of works-based religion or, or righteousness, saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just not good enough, or... Uh, maybe there's been abuse and, and someone just can't see how God could still possibly love them or want them. Or, or maybe someone's going through just some really difficult circumstances and as a result is maybe questioning God's love for them. Now, that's just a few examples, but whatever the issue, there has to be teaching and, and counsel and correction addressing the underlying issue. After this, however, we see the second part of Paul's counsel and in this part of his response, it's, it's a much more broad and, and general encouragement. And it's actually a prayer as well. And this is the part we're going to be looking at tonight. This part of his response, it's, it's a sweeping view of, of salvation grounded in, in biblical truth and the reality of who God is that goes beyond just one situation or context. So whether you're someone who's, who's currently maybe struggling with this issue, or maybe you're someone who does feel very confident and grounded in their salvation, this, this passage gives us explicitly the grounds upon which we can all be confident and confidently stand firm in God's grace and the salvation which he has purchased us. And the hope as well is that we might be able to use what we learn in this passage, what this teaches us, to be able to encourage and strengthen others, each other, as well. So with that note, let's pray, ask for God's help with this, and then we'll get into our text. God, thank you so much for your salvation. Thank you for all that you did, that you went through. Jesus, for going to the cross for us to purchase our salvation that we could never achieve on our own. 
And even, Lord, just for choosing us to be your people. God, by looking at this passage tonight, would you give us, give us confidence, the confidence that we should have in you because you hold us first. You hold us fast, Lord. And we thank you for that. Give us ears to hear your passage and hearts to understand. Amen. Well, if we were to revisit uh, the first section of chapter 2, uh, we would remember that Paul had just explained about the man of lawlessness and the day of the Lord, which we've mentioned a couple of times now. Uh, but towards the end of that section, the focus shifts from the man of lawlessness to the people who follow him. Read with me from verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie so that all will be condemned those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. Now, I can only imagine, as they were reading through this letter, uh, at this point the Thessalonians are thinking, yes, but, but we thought we were different. Right? We, we thought we were not like those who were perishing. Right? We do believe the truth. We do delight in righteousness. So what about us? And this is really where our section begins tonight at verse 13. So verse 13. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord. Why? Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in terms of encouragement, this is, this is no quick pat on the back or she'll be right. Paul, Paul writes us to, to ground their confidence in God, right? For it is God and God alone who saves. And he, he packs six statements into these two verses. And just like a a well-made solid road which um, would be firm upon we, which we can walk, has many layers, right? Each of these truths, they kind of contribute a, a layer or an aspect to the foundation upon which our confidence stands for salvation and hope in Christ. So we're going to make our way through these six truths. Now, the first two speak of our source of salvation. The first thing he says about them is that they are loved by the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ loves the Thessalonians as he loves all his people, you and me. John 15, 12 to 13 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Just think about this reality for a second. God, the God, who created this universe, all of it, who created you and me personally, right? he, he took the time to consider how he would design you and make you. The God who literally controls everything, because of the love that he has for us, gave himself over to death on the cross for our sake. I'll tell you what, if you ever start to doubt your salvation, this is a great place to start. Remember God's incredible love for us in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And remember that Jesus didn't just love you past tense, but his love for you is, is then, now, and forever. Right? Jesus still loves you okay? and will always love you. How can we be sure? Well, well, that's layer number one. I'd love to spend the whole sermon there, but that's layer, layer number one. We'll keep going. Okay, to layer number two, or aspect two, we are chosen by God. He says, from the beginning, God has chosen you. Before God created anything, 
God planned out what history would look like. He planned what he would make. He planned who he would make and when he would make them. He planned which nations would rise and fall. He planned to uh, foreshadow and reveal the first and the still-awaited second coming of Jesus. He planned everything. And part of that plan was you and me. And part of that plan was that he has chosen us to be his. And we can rest assured in our salvation because God himself chose to purchase us with Jesus' blood and make us his own from since before the beginning of time. I mean, isn't, isn't that just incredible? But upon hearing this, you might think to yourself, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't sound like you're actually, like we get much of a choice in this matter. Well, we certainly play a part in our salvation, and we'll get to that in short, but in a moment. But the short answer is, well, well yeah, pretty much. Uh, and be glad that you don't. <laughs> Genesis 6.5. Let me, I've got two verses for you here. <laughs> Genesis 6.5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of, uh, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In Romans 3, 10 to 11, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. We are, we are such slaves to sin that we would never, of our own accord, choose God. In, in fact, we can't. That's, that's why we're called slaves to sin. Right? Sin owns us. It's, it's our master. So, so if God didn't choose us and, and redeem us, we would never have come to him. We would never have come to saving faith in Christ. And we would never have, have received and enjoyed his love. And we would be under his curse, the curse of his wrath forever. So yeah, God chose us and, and we should be very glad that he did. But, but also consider that he chose us, as we read, from the beginning. God's plan always included us being saved. And God isn't going to unchoose us. Right? God made one plan for history, and that's it. So if God has saved us, if he has chosen us, he's not going to unsave us. You are his forever, and he is yours forever. He is ours. So the source of our salvation is, is God. God initiates by loving and choosing us. That's why it's said that, and why we say that we are saved by grace alone as well. Right? Grace is unmerited favor. We didn't earn it. It is something that God has given us, not something that is taken. It's a gift of grace, lovingly given, and I think you'd agree with me, joyfully received. The next two truths we're going to do together. Uh, and these are more to do with the means of our salvation. So sanctified by the Spirit and belief in truth. He says through, so through, our salvation is through the sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. So previously, Jesus, the Lord, and God, the Father, have both just been mentioned. And now we see the third member of the Trinity um, present as well, the Holy Spirit is being mentioned here. So we'll take a quick look at the Spirit's participation in our salvation. Uh, Ephesians 1.13, In him, that is Christ, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. So these elements of, of the Spirit and our, us believing the truth are linked See, when we heard the gospel, when we believed the gospel, that is the truth, we were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now, that sounds a little bit like the, the Spirit is the passive participant, and we, who actually have to do the believing, are the active participants. But remember what we just learned, right? If We would never have actually chosen God for ourselves. God had to choose us. So how is it that we can believe the truth if we're slaves to sin. John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you 
into all truth. See, it's actually the Spirit who is actively leading and guiding us into all truth and preparing our hearts and minds to be able to believe the truth. The one thing that we needed to do, we, we couldn't even do ourselves. God had to grant that to us as well. But it's an interesting phrasing here as well. Paul says, through sanctification by the Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So why not just say uh, through, through possession or through having the Spirit or through the indwelling of the Spirit? Why, why through sanctification by the Spirit? Well, remember here that the point of Paul's writing is to give confidence to the Thessalonians regarding their salvation. If Paul just says, uh, having the Holy Spirit, how would they know if they definitely have the Holy Spirit? You can't tell just by looking. There's no uh, tattoo or or halo that appears. I think that would be pretty cool, but it doesn't. Um, Paul says, through sanctification, because when we are saved... The Holy Spirit uh, not just seals our salvation, but continues to live in us, producing fruit that is in accordance with the salvation that we've been granted. So so sanctification is the evidence of being indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And sanctification is visible. Now, I think you'd agree, however, it's, it's often more visible to others than it is to ourselves. So at this point, I just throw in an encouragement here for you that we should actually be encouraging each other in this regard. Or even just a, just a simple statement like, hey, I've noticed that, and then, and then fill in the blank, it, it, something positive that you can see God is working in their life. It can be really, really encouraging, surprisingly encouraging, actually. I say surprisingly because it, it happened to me um, once. I was, I was talking with someone uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and part of the conversation, I, I think I must, must have said something like, oh, I just don't feel like I'm growing, I'm making progress in my Christian walk, or something like that. Uh, and they came, they came back pretty strong, actually, well, and they said, well, yeah, you used to be pretty flaky with your church attendance. You weren't really involved in anything um, or with anyone, and I think there's a few other things that really um, humbled me. Uh, but, thankfully, they didn't stop there. Um, they said, but now I can actually see in you that you know, you're keen and, and determined not just to, to come to church, but actively seeking out you know, good Bible teaching, seeking out discipleship, and to get involved in things that don't just benefit yourself. Um, it, it Honestly, it left me quite shocked. I think it's probably the first time anyone's said something nice about my Christian growth. Um, <laughs> Possibly because it was the only time it was necessary. Anyway, we're good now. It's been a couple of years of growth since then as well. Hope, maybe you can encourage me in that regard too. Um, let me find my place here. Yeah, it, it, it really it, it, it shocked me because um, I, I hadn't noticed that change. I, I couldn't see. I didn't see that comparison of myself then to now. And it, it was really encouraging, surprisingly encouraging for me, to know that God has actually been working in my life, um, that he's actually been there. He's uh, bringing about fruit. Even just to know that I am loved and, and cared for and even just noticed by God, I haven't just been left alone. It was a wonderful thing. So if you're able to encourage someone by, by helping them see how God is working in their lives, please do so. Uh, not to boost egos, mind you, um, but just to, just to encourage each other as we walk through life's ups and, da- ups and downs together. And evidence of our self- sanctification, I think at least, is some of the strongest evidence of our salvation. So, it is upon the Lord's love, God's choosing, the Spirit's sanctification, and our own belief in the truth that we can be absolutely sure and rest firmly and strongly on for our salvation. Now, the fifth truth describes more of a practical reality of what coming to salvation looks like and summarizes a couple of the points we've got so far too. He says, He called you to this through our gospel. Now, he called is, of course, similar to God chose and through our gospel is kind of touching back to you know, through belief in the truth. But, but in this statement, Paul takes these, these general truths that he's just presented and 
kind of reminds them that this actually happened to them, right, to the Thessalonians. Uh, also remember uh, that there were people who were bringing in false teaching as well, which is why he is saying our gospel. Right? Not that he's saying, oh, yeah, I made this thing up, here's my gospel. He's just referring to the fact that it's the gospel that he gave them compared to any of these people who are coming in to try to deceive them. And, and what is that gospel that he presented? Well, it is that Jesus is the Christ. Right? That his death paid the penalty for our sins. We were just singing that. And through which he gave us his righteousness, his, his right standing before God. And that he was raised to life and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Spurgeon makes this link between what we've just been talking about with our gospel assurance and the gospel message of Christ as well. He says, It is not your hold on Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not even your faith in Christ, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit. We must remember that the gospel is the power of God for, to salvation for all who believe. And we must come back to the gospel over and over and over again so as to not forget all that Jesus did for us, is doing, and what he will achieve for us as well, which leads nicely to the final truth we've got here. Uh, because everything so far has been past or present focused, this one's a little more future focused. He says, So that you might... Obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, glory encapsulates a number of elements, uh, such as uh, dignity and, and honor, uh, through to uh, a worthiness to be praised and worshipped. But we are given hope of a dignity. Hang on. We do not get the glory of Jesus in the same sense that we too will be equal to God in some way, right? But we're not ever going to be counted as being worthy of being praised or worshipped. But we are given a, a hope of dignity and honor. See, in this world, we're going to be mocked. Okay? We're going to be ridiculed for believing in God and living our lives according to his word. Right? We're going to be thought of poorly by others. But when Jesus comes back, all, they included, will see Jesus in all his glory. And he will be gathering us to himself, to be with him in his glory. And Jesus will acknowledge us on that day, and honor us, and elevate us above, above those who did not believe and love the truth. And in this, notice also that just as salvation is a gift given by God, so it is in this we cannot uh, reach out and, and, and obtain or grab some glory for ourselves. On the contrary, right? Jesus teaches us that we are to serve one another, right? That we are to be last, for the last shall be first. And the last shall be first, why? Because it is Jesus that gives them that position. And it is in Jesus that we, in any glory that we might obtain, it is a free gift from Jesus himself. We just seek to be faithful in this life. Right? Even if it means being treated poorly, right? being spoken of or thought of poorly. Right? For God knows. He sees our faithfulness. He values it. He honors it. And he sustains us to continue to be faithful, especially in the hope that we will obtain glory, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a great future hope that, that encourages us to hold fast to the promise of our salvation because we know how great the outcome is of that salvation. Well, as I said at the start, Paul really didn't hold back in these couple verses. He really wanted the Thessalonians to be sure, super confident of their salvation. So he reminds them of, uh, what well, he reminds them of the three members of the Trinitarian God all working together to, to call them and us to salvation and uh, have them, and us, uh, believe in the truth. Despite how much is in these, these two jam-packed verses, we can summarize the main point so far, a pretty succinct little statement. 
the triune God has, definitely has, secured our salvation. So what comes next then? Uh, note that after reminding us of these truths, the next two words in the next verse are so then. So, so, so based upon these truths, right, what is Paul's conclusion for the Thessalonians? Right, and in, indirectly for us. Let's keep reading. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions or the teachings you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. So the so then is stand firm and, and hold fast. Remember, the, the Thessalonians' uh, fear, it came from this false teaching they were given. Right? Others had come in and confused them, told them false information, even forged letters from Paul. So, so Paul is very clear here. You stand firm and you hold fast. The first few verses gave a, a reminder of what the Thessalonians know or should know. And, and now Paul tells them what to do with that knowledge. Right? Now standing firm and, and holding fast, they're not things that happen passively. Right? They require deliberate and continual effort. Uh, what does standing firm and holding fast to the truth look like? Well, do not neglect the truth that you've been taught, but embrace it. Right? Do not walk away from the truth, but, but revisit it often so that we do not forget. Do not confuse it or, or interbreed it with other worldly teachings, right? but hold fast to the pure truth, the word of God. See, what, Paul, what Paul taught the Thessalonians is no more or less than what Paul heard from God himself, right? as Paul has described about his teaching in other letters. Now, this, of course, is directly applicable to, to ourselves as well. Right? We, can, we get bombarded by this philosophy and that idea and this opinion constantly from the world. And the standard that society uh, and culture seems to hold for this issue or that is always shifting. Right? Do not, you know, we need to not let ourselves be, be taken in by these messages. Right? Do not learn right and wrong from the world. Do not try to live by any standard by which the world might try to measure you. Right? Stand firm and hold fast to God's word. When we get knocked around because of our faith, right, do not be discouraged. Right? When people reject us because of our faith, remember that they rejected Jesus. Right? Remember that the Holy Spirit has made his home in us. Right? Remember that God has given us each other. So stand firm in the grace of God by which he purchased our salvation, by which he purchased and adopted us at the cost of Jesus' innocent blood. Remember that he loves us and chose us and will honor us by having us share in his glory. And every time the truth is challenged, and it's hard because that's so often, but every time the truth is challenged, make the effort to deliberately remember the truth that is written in Scripture. So let's, let's add this to our main point then. Right, the triune God has secured our salvation, so stand firm upon his word and his accomplished work. And I've, I've added accomplished work there because we need to remember that, that it is finished. Right? Nothing and no one can undo what Christ did on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to bear our sins and our punishment for them. He has already paid the price. All that's left to do is, it really, is, is to have his chosen people be born into history and through the work of the Holy Spirit, have them accept his prepaid gift of salvation. So we must stand firm. Now, as we move to the last little section, the last two verses, and not in the CSB, but in a lot of translations, um, they start with the word now. And, and I like that. I think it's appropriate, at least, because the next two verses, they feel as if, uh, as Paul concludes this whole section about security in our salvation, it feels like he's answering the question, well, now what? And, and he does this uh, as a prayer for the Thessalonians. Let's read verse 16 and 17. May our Lord... And I'm going to add the word now. Now... May our Lord Jesus Christ himself 
and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Well, Paul starts by, by stating the, the outworking or, or the practical outcome of having a secure salvation. He says that God has given us an eternal encouragement, or some translations say comfort, eternal comfort, and good hope in grace. And, and he says it definitively. God has given us these things. Having a salvation that is secure in the Lord, who loves us and gave himself for us, is encouragement to, to stay the course. How so? Well, when, as I said of the Thessalonians, or as is said of the Thessalonians, when we persevere through difficult circumstances, through trials, through rejection, or, or, or some sort of persecution, this is evidence of our salvation. This is evidence that on the last day we may be found worthy of the kingdom of God. Our encouragement is grounded in his love and his finished work in securing our salvation. But also, in what awaits, we have a good hope. All that we are called to endure in this life, as difficult as it can be, is temporary. And it serves to help prepare us for what is everlasting. And what is that? Well, a life unending with God our Creator, our Saviour, our Lord and Friend, in a place where there will be joy unending. By grace, God gives us an unshakable confidence in our salvation, and through this, an eternal encouragement and a good hope. Unlike those who will follow the man of lawlessness, whose hope will be destroyed, our hope in Christ will be realized. Well, I'm going to reread both of those verses and we'll, we'll look at verse 17. So he says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, what will he do? May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. With an internal encouragement and with good hope, Paul also prays that God would encourage and strengthen us in every good work and word. We have a tendency when we hear the words uh, to stand firm or to hold fast, to imagine maybe someone just planting, them, planting themselves, planting their feet on the spot, ready to you know, deflect some blow, or uh, perhaps withholding fast. You know, there's maybe a, a fast-running river, and someone's holding fast to a branch or a rock so that they don't get swept away. And, and there are, of course, elements in, in which those images are very appropriate, but, it, but here they aren't the full picture. See, see in holding fast to the truth it actually frees us to go out and live good lives. Right? We don't just try to hold on to survive. Right? We don't just take a defensive position. We go out into the world, right? grounded in the Word, grounded in God, so that we may discern what is good and bad, right or wrong, and live our lives accordingly. It's not when you hide away, but rather when you live a life that's different, that the world actually sees you. And those not of God's flock will see you in ridicule. They see me in ridicule. That's before they know that I'm a Christian. Um, sure, but sorry. But that's okay. Because we know, we know how it all ends. And we don't need to worry. We have a good God who is with us and will carry us through to the good hope he has for us. It's like Z said this morning. Um, we need to not just trust and remember that God has saved us, what he has done for us, but we need to remember and trust that he is active and present in our lives right now, what he is doing. And the Thessalonians were instructed, uh, as the Thessalonians were instructed, so we too are to live out good lives. Lives that are kind and compassionate. Lives that are lived with integrity. 
lives uh, lived according to God's word. Because such lives bring God glory. They bring us joy. And they are evidence to ourselves and to others of our salvation. Well, because such lives cannot be lived of our own accord, right? But only through the power of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies, strengthens, and encourages us. And so it's with this that we, we get to finish our main point. The triune God has secured our salvation, so stand firm upon his word and his accomplished work. Stand firm, but do not stand still. Live confidently in a way worthy of the gospel to which you were called. And before I end, I just want to highlight something else. I was doing a run through this afternoon, and it just dawned on me. There's one other thing that this passage really highlights that we haven't mentioned yet, not explicitly at least. All of this, all that we have, all of our grounding, our security, our hope for a future, we have this in good measure because God is good. This is a reflection of, of God. He is good. He is loving. He is beyond anything we can ever hope for or imagine. And I think it's just important as we finish this to remember and remind ourselves that he is good and that he loves us and that he holds us strong. Right? As the Spurgeon quote said, it's not our grip on God, it's God's grip on us. And we just need to, we need to praise him and thank him for that. So let's, let's pray, let's do that. Let's thank God for our salvation. God, thank you for making it so clear in your word that we are able to trust you for our salvation. Thank you, first and foremost, for even purchasing a salvation for us. There was no need. We are not deserving in any way, Lord. But you and your love for us reached out. And God, we will, we will never be able to thank you enough. God, as we, as we rest firmly upon these, these truths, would you help us to live our lives accordingly? Lord, would we not be afraid to be seen in public as Christians? Would we not hide away? Would we, would we be bold to, to speak of you? God, would you encourage us and remind us always of the hope that we have in you, that we will be with you forever, that you will gather us to yourselves. Thank you, Lord. Amen.